South Central Los Angeles is world famous. Whether it's for the gangster rap pioneers of N.W.A. that gave us Straight Outta Compton and the careers of Dr. Dre and Ice Cube, or iconic movies depicting local gang culture like Boys in the Hood. For years, all over LA and the world at large, people have been fascinated about life on the most dangerous streets of the world's most famous city. And of course, the real gangs behind the popular media are nothing to be trivialized. Los Angeles was the birthplace of modern-day gang culture. The Bloods and Crips emerged out of LA, bringing decades of violence and bloodshed to their inner city communities. And unfortunately, as the years have gone by, young, vulnerable men growing up in difficult areas have been born into an endless cycle of gang violence, bringing decades of death and destruction to black and other minority communities in the city. With this whole situation made even worse by institutional racism and a lack of investment into these communities that need the help the most. But today's story isn't about a disadvantaged youth born into a difficult situation, using their talents in music to overcome and escape the dangers of the street life, no. Today, we're taking a look at what happens when a rich, privileged white teenager becomes obsessed with gang culture and decides to cross the border from the affluent, gated community they were born into to the dangerous, gang-affiliated streets of South Central, making an active choice to shun their privilege and join the rolling 90s Crips. However, when things escalate and a young man loses his life at the hands of gang violence, that young, well-off man would flee South Central returning to the safety of his wealthy community and parents' home. And with the help of his rich parents, an eye-watering amount of money, and a seemingly prejudiced legal system, he would completely avoid any responsibility for his actions, whilst his two black co-defendants rot in jail facing full-blown murder charges. This is the story of Cameron Terrell, aka the Rich White Crip. You'll be walking down the street and you'll see like a group of black dudes walking, you know, Thugs. In a group, they got like one or two, sometimes as many as three white guys to be with them. You ever seen this shit? Those white guys are the most dangerous motherfuckers in them groups. Cameron Terrell in many ways won the birth lottery when he was born. He popped out on US soil as a white man to two extremely wealthy parents. Cameron was the only child of interior designer Deborah Terrell and media executive Donald Wayne Terrell. His father Donald, at the time of this story taking place, was the president of a successful media consulting firm called New and Improved Media in El Segundo, California. With over 25 years in the game, having worked with brands like Fox, McDonald's, Nike, and the California Lottery. And his company was working with the biggest TV network works in the game too. Clearly the marketing game was lucrative for the Terrells, as they were able to raise their son Cameron in a luxury property on the exclusive Palos Verdes estates, in what Forbes once described as one of America's most expensive zip codes, with the average household income there back in 2015 being a whopping $245,000. The Terrells mansion style home was allegedly 3,878 square feet, with a price tag of a whopping $1.8 million. And they had a whole lot of luxury vehicles parked outside too, with a Porsche Cayenne SUV regularly spotted in the driveway, and Cameron himself known for driving a brand new Mercedes. Cameron would attend the local Palos Verdes High School, and by all accounts he grew up as a normal suburban kid. His life wasn't short of privilege, and growing up he would get opportunities to broaden his horizons and see the world. Reportedly vacationing in Mexico at beaches and resorts where Cameron would enjoy fishing, dirt biking, and board games with his family. However, at some point, trouble would emerge in the domestic bliss of the Terrells' household, with his lawyer later revealing that issues with his parents' relationship drove Cameron to rebel, spending more time out of the house and eventually hanging out in a South Central LA park where he would befriend local teenagers. Story has it that Cameron would run away from home, spending weeks at a time with his new friends' families, eventually even calling other women who had taken him in, mum. And over time, these friends that he made hanging out in South Central would be approached by older men in their community, eventually being inducted into the local gang, the Rolling 90s Crips. And in the end, it would be Cameron's connection to this very street gang that would spark a series of events that would eventually see another young man losing his life and Cameron and his friends behind bars facing murder charges. The blue bandana wearing Crips are one of the world's most infamous gangs. Starting out in Los Angeles as early as 1969, the Crips are a loosely connected network of sets operating in different areas all over the city. And the particular set that Cameron Terrell ended up becoming affiliated with were known as the Rolling 90s, part of the larger Neighborhood Crip Alliance or CARD. Now, there's numerous Neighborhood Crip sets in the Alliance whose names correspond to the streets their crew are from. For example, the Rolling 90s might be friendly with the Rolling 60s, of which Nipsey Hussle was famously a member. With many sets belonging to the Neighborhood Crip card, this doesn't necessarily 
necessarily mean that all Crip sets in Los Angeles are friendly to each other. In fact, the neighborhood Crips have a long-running feud with another card known as the Gangster Crips. For example, the 8-3 Gangster Crips, or 8-Tray, located nearby. This means that essentially, a rolling 90s Crip could take one wrong turn into nearby 8-Tray territory and find themselves being killed on sight, and vice versa. Now, rolling 90s territory is a stretch from Van Ness Avenue and Western Avenue between Manchester Boulevard and Century Boulevard. With the street of Western Avenue that runs through this territory being a symbolic place of importance for the rolling 90s Crips. And as a way of signalling their allegiance to the group, members often wear t-shirts reading Western Avenue. Another example of this is the regular use by rolling 90s Crips of the logo of the sports team, the Washington Nationals, due to the prominence of the letter W in their logo, with the W standing once again for Western Avenue. Now, another important location for the rolling 90s is nearby Jesse Owens Park, and it's believed that this is where Cameron Terrell was initiated into the rolling 90s Crips, and it's also where he spent a lot of time after departing his family home over 20 miles away from where he lived. In fact, the father of one of his eventual co-defendants would even tell reporters that Cameron Terrell would often pull up to the area in his brand new Mercedes, and over time, becoming heavily involved in street activity going on in the area. According to a later LA Times article quoting his own lawyer, Cameron apparently thought that the gang lifestyle was cool, and over this period, in his spare time, he was closely studying gang culture, apparently going on what was described as an LA gang binge, reading numerous books about gang life in the city. And once he'd been initiated into the rolling 90s, Cameron will begin to be seen regularly wearing blue on social media, hanging around at the park wearing a blue bandana, and riding around the area in luxury cars with his friends. As I've already mentioned, Cameron was known for driving a brand new Mercedes, which allegedly he even became known in the area for letting people borrow. In addition to that, it's also believed that he would regularly give away luxury designer clothes to his gang-affiliated friends. At a certain point, Cameron Terrell would swap his family fishing vacations in Mexico for spring break with the Crips. He would even get a tattoo of the Washington Nationals W on his chest to represent his love for Western Avenue. And eventually, Cameron would even appear in a music video for a song called Neighborhood Anthem, a literal anthem for the Neighborhood Crips. In that video, numerous other people with a tattoo of the Washington Nationals W would appear alongside Cameron, who appeared extensively wearing a blue bandana surrounded by fellow Crips, as well as a whole bunch of weapons. Cameron himself would appear extensively in this video, rapping along to the song, seemingly even rapping along to the N-word numerous times. And if now, some people in the comments have mocked Cameron, with some even joking that the iced-out Hublot watch in the video must have belonged to Milk's father. Milk being a nickname that Cameron had adopted around this time, which he would use publicly on his Facebook, which he also updated to include another reference to the Washington Nationals. Other nicknames reportedly given to Cameron around this time were White Boy, as well as Bright Eyes or Blue Eyes. Clearly, Cameron Terrell had become truly integrated into the rolling 90s Crips. And despite his privileged upbringing, he had escaped the suburban bliss of Palos Verdes and become a truly accepted member of the South Central gang world. However, he would soon find out that there was more to gangbanging than music videos, tattoos, and blue bandanas, and he would end up in a situation where another young man would end up losing his life, and at least for a moment, it seemed as if Cameron would have to face up to the full consequences of life as a gangbanger. On October the 1st, 2017, Cameron Terrell would drive two friends in the Mercedes-Benz his father bought him to the intersection of West 78th Street and Western Avenue, allegedly the territory of the rolling 90s main rivals, the HRA Gangster Crips. The people in Cameron's car were armed and looking for confrontation. Two young men would jump out the back of the black Mercedes whilst Cameron remained in sight. At about 11.26am, Justin Holmes and two other men were walking west on West 78th Street, approaching Southwestern Avenue. They would be approached by Cameron's two friends, who allegedly asked Holmes and his friends what gang they were from. Holmes allegedly told the teens that he didn't gangbang. In fact, he was reportedly working a legitimate job for U-Haul at this time and only visiting his friends in the area on his day off. However, clearly, this isn't the answer the rolling 90s were looking for, as this exchange would be followed by somebody pulling a gun and opening fire. Holmes would be wounded by these gunshots, while the two shooters would run back to the Mercedes, getting inside as Cameron Terrell hit the gas and escaped with this frantic getaway even being captured on surveillance video. 21-year-old Justin Alongino Holmes would be taken to hospital and pronounced dead at 12.02 p.m. According to later claims by prosecutors, Cameron Terrell went home the very night of the murder and recorded a video in his own bathroom, throwing gang signs and essentially celebrating the murder that would enhance his status within the gang. In addition to this, video would later surface where Terrell had seemingly returned to the scene of the murder just six days later, filming his friends kicking over the candles at a memorial for the victim left at the scene 
scene of the crime. With all of this in mind, most reasonable people would think that Cameron's involvement in the crime was cut and dry. However, as Cameron, his co-defendants, and the whole world was about to find out, Cameron Terrell had an ace up his sleeve, which unfortunately, his co-defendants did not share. 18-year-old Cameron Terrell and his two juvenile co-defendants would be arrested on October the 12th, 2017, on charges of premeditated murder of Justin Holmes and two attempted murder charges for the friends that were with him that day. The suspects were arrested just 12 days after the murder and six days after vandalizing the victim's memorial. The two shooters who were under 18 at the time of the arrest would be held in a juvenile facility, the Silmar Juvenile Hall. But unlike his African-American co-defendants who would remain incarcerated, Cameron would be back on the streets just a week later by October 19th. Cameron Terrell was reportedly set a $5 million bail with his rich parents immediately fronting up $500,000 in cash to get him out no less than a week after his arrest. Cameron would subsequently be spotted in public enjoying a World Series baseball game at LA's Dodger Stadium, reportedly just days after his release. All while his two co-defendants, two African-American teens later revealed to be aged 16 and 17, would remain incarcerated without bail. Civil rights attorneys at the time would call out this decision to grant rich white Cameron Terrell bail and deny it to his poorer black co-defendants, suggesting that this was a double standard. With all of that in mind, it's no surprise that this was bringing a lot of negative attention to the Terrell family. Not only were the news admonishing them for enjoying public life after such a heinous crime had been committed, but soon internet trolls would also play a part, beginning to leave negative reviews for Cameron's father's business, New and Improved Media, with one hilarious review saying, they have some killer instincts and will provide great getaway ideas for any client, regardless of gang affiliation. Initially, it was thought that the local Palos Verdes High School that he attended would stick by him and allow him to continue attending classes. With the school district superintendent initially suggesting that Cameron still had a right to an education, claiming that it would take more to exclude a student from the school. However, pressure began piling up as parents of other children at the school began to protest, with a November the 13th demonstration seeing furious parents gathering at the school demanding Terrell be suspended from classes, with direct reports from other parents suggesting that they feared gang retaliations targeting Terrell, catching their kids in the crossfire. This morning, a group of parents stand on the corner of PV High School while another walks out from talking to the principal, trying to get answers. I'm not thoroughly convinced that they have this under control. To have a, an adult who is charged with the worst crime possible being allowed to attend school with 3,000 kids, it's not right, and I believe the education code supports his suspension. Parents telling us if there are gang ties, they are worried about possible retaliation. One parent showing us the email response she received from the superintendent regarding her concern about student safety. One woman being interviewed by the news suggested that other children are scared to come to school and that she believed that Terrell was proud of being able to walk back onto campus after catching a murder charge. I care about the safety of my student and nobody from the school district has communicated to me what they are doing to, for the safety of our students that are here. We've got attorneys that work for this school and they need to get this kid out. My students told me things that, you know, the, the kid's very confident about walking on this campus and this is kind of a braggadocious um, badge of honor for him. The individual is not stable and they can't predict what he's gonna do on any level and he should not be a danger to our children here. Following the parent protest, it was reported that the school had changed course and confirmed that Cameron Terrell would no longer be attending classes at the exclusive school, with it being stated that Terrell's continued attendance at the school would be a distraction and potential danger to other students. All of this negative attention led the Terrell family to withdraw from public life, with ABC7 News doorstepping the family at their luxurious home but receiving no comment. Terrell isn't from South LA. He's from this affluent section of Palos Verdes, where eyewitness news reporter Carlos Granda recently visited the family's home to see if anyone would comment. Hi, I'm uh, here from Channel 7. I was trying to see if anyone is available to comment about Cameron. No, we're not. It's Channel 7 News. No, we're not. But it wasn't just the privileged white Terrell family being asked for answers. The likes of Chico from the Rolling 90s, the rapper behind that neighborhood anthem song that Cameron appeared in the music video for, would also be asked about his video being all over the news after Cameron's case went public, leading to an extremely awkward street TV interview where he refused to answer any questions. The video has been getting a lot of local news attention. Right. And it came across my desk. I checked it out and was like, oh, this thing bumped. But do you want to talk about how your, that video was all over the news a couple weeks ago and, and the, uh, the situation that led up to that? Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about that. 
Okay. Um, let's see. And if you don't want to answer this next question, that's cool too. Because people are going to ask me why I didn't ask. But it, it's known that there's a, a, a white dude that that hangs out in the neighborhood. Uh, how does that come about? A dude that not didn't grow up over here by Jesse Owens Park that ends up being affiliated. I don't know. Oh, no, I don't know nothing about it. Okay. One person who was willing to speak, though, was the father of one of Terrell's black co-defendants, who would check in with studious LA journalist Jasmine Kanick for an interview, which took place in Jesse Owens Park itself. And in this illuminating interview, he would open up about the double standard of keeping his black son in jail for the same crime that white Cameron Terrell was able to bail out on with ease. First of all, my son going through hell, you know, in the juvenile system. He just turned 17, but he ain't there for a serious crime, you know. But I can't understand that how this other guy, because of a color thing and a color issue, he able to walk the streets and be freely able to go to school, go to baseball games. He not on no strict restrictions, not on no uh, monitor, don't have a house to break later on his ankle or nothing. So basically, he was in the same case with my son and his other juvenile, but they still got the other two kids in there why he's free to roam the streets and do whatever he want to do. They're both charged with the same charges, correct? Yes, ma'am. So that would be attempted murder and murder. But yes, ma'am. The other, the two black right. boys are in. They still incarcerated. He would go on to open up about Cameron Terrell coming around the rolling 90s neighborhood, saying that they were surprised he'd come into the neighborhood and suggesting he isn't as innocent as he's making out. So a lot of people are wondering whether or not uh, Cameron Terrell was coerced into this, was oh, forced no. into joining oh, no. a black gang. No. Um, that he, you know, that he's innocent in all of this oh, somehow. No. Can you kind of explain to me the history of this white boy in South yeah. LA? Well, first of all, ma'am, we were shocked when he ended up popping up over here. Didn't nobody know about him or nothing, but believe it or not, we ain't racist over here. We gonna accept you whether what color you are or not. That's the difference what people understand. Black people don't have nothing to be racist about. We already been doing bad. We already been getting treated uh, injustice in the system, period. So what, what racism we want to have? So we accepted him. But the thing what people need to know, he's not the person so innocent like the people on the news for trying to pretend and everything like, you know, he's not like- What do you mean? Well, basically I'm saying this, he came, he was down here, he was involved and he was out here with the same kids that's in this community. He didn't just pop up this one time only, and he didn't nobody force him. Used to see him hanging around, or? All the time, there's somebody that used to come to my house, man. This is not my first time meeting this boy. So Cameron was pretty much known around here. Oh yeah. Even oh, yeah. up here at this park, up oh, here at Jesse what? Owens. Oh yes, yes ma'am. Yes ma'am, this, this like, it's like, you know, is we couldn't figure it out, but we one thing we always knew, like if something ever happened, I hate to say it, if something ever happened, we knew it was going to be a difference. He would go on to say that he was confused when Cameron began turning up to the hood in a brand new Mercedes, suggesting that he believed something wasn't adding up, and even suggesting that Cameron might have been instigating street activity himself. Been many occasions he pulled up at my house in his car, in his brand new car. I couldn't figure it what out then. What kind of car did he have? A brand new Mercedes Benz. That's all, that was shocking to me right there. I was like, wait a minute, what you doing with my child? And what you dealing with my child? First of all, it went about the color thing, but then I looked at the color issue and why you want to deal with these kids that's in the inner city that really don't have nothing to offer you, period. If anything, he was in control. Because you got to understand, he the one with the money, with the nice house, with the nice cars, with the nice schools. What do the other two juveniles have? They following his lead. He in control. Jasmine would go on to interview another local who knew Cameron Terrell personally from his time hanging around in Jesse Owens Park. He would also suggest that Terrell was not so innocent, suggesting that he had involved himself deeply in street politics and was excited by the trouble he was getting into in the area. He'd suggest that Cameron had caused a problem and then fled back to his rich community, leaving his poor black friends behind. Cameron, you know, he's not as innocent as everybody would say. Some say he's innocent, some say he's not, but the fact of the matter is that you're around here. You're excited by what's going on in your generation. So you're down here hanging with these kids. You're getting in all kind of trouble with these kids. Now when the pressure is on, now you flee back to Palace Verde. 
to a safe haven that you know and you're trying to leave these kids stuck out here with something that you're involved in so at some point you're gonna have to answer for that so because this is a racial thing now you know they're trying to make it seem like we're just this violent race like this and he just got caught up in it and he was forced to do all this stuff no you wasn't so he was down here all the time you're down here all the time you're, you're hanging with these kids you got caught up with what these kids were doing and he would go on to say that he believed Terrell was only accepted by the local community due to his fancy car and the money. Why do you think he was accepted down here? Like Because of, you know, his stance in life where he had, you know, his car, his money, what he could provide, you know, uh, the free ride in life. You know, these kids don't have anything when they wake up down here. They, you know, they come to this park. This is basically all they got. And then here comes a guy in their age bracket that got a fancy car that can get them clothes, that can do all this stuff for them. Of course they're going to get in there. And he feels some type of way about them, and they feel some way about him. But the problem is when everything goes bad, you resort back to your habitat. And your habitat is Palace Verdes. It's not Jesse Owens Park. It's not... Western. It's not none of these streets where these same kids have to deal with. Now, these interviews didn't get much attention in the mainstream media at the time, but in my opinion, they provide a valuable insight into the truth behind Cameron Terrell's story. But no matter how things looked to local observers, what really mattered was what the jury thought. And once it came time for trial, unsurprisingly, we would see the Terrell family once again using their wealth to provide Cameron an advantage in the courtroom with a hotshot private attorney being brought in to make an impressive case for Cameron's freedom. And the ultimate result, leaving many in the community that had previously accepted Cameron shocked in disbelief. When it came time for trial, the Terrell family would employ the legal services of Javon Blacknell to defend Cameron. Blacknell is a superstar LA lawyer who would actually go on to defend the stink team's Ralphie the Plug, in his case stemming from the gang indictment that was used to lock up Draco the Ruler for around two years. If you want to know more about that case, go and check out my video on the life and death of Draco the Ruler. Javon Blacknell is a master lawyer. In fact, he famously got a man off on murder charges when he was caught by the cops loading a three-day-old decomposing body and a can of gasoline into his truck. With such an impressive track record, Blacknell was essentially able to build a bulletproof defense for Cameron. On the 29th of October 2017, Cameron Terrell would plead not guilty to the charges against him, later being seen leaving the courthouse with his parents and lawyer. Prosecutors alleged that Terrell was the getaway driver for the two shooters in the murder of Justin Holmes, with a detective testifying that Cameron admitted that he himself was the getaway driver. He did admit that he was driving the car at the time. He drove his car out of the alley and made a right turn on 78th Street. However, Cameron Terrell's hotshot legal team crafted a whopper of a defense, with the main argument being that Terrell had no idea that the boys with him would kill Holmes that day, with it being suggested that on the day of the shooting, Terrell thought that the three of them would simply be going to the area to do graffiti, and saying that he didn't expect to hear gunshots and didn't know that anybody in the car had a weapon, even going as far as to say that there was no way Terrell would have driven his daddy's car if he knew that a shooting was going down. Throughout the trial, Terrell's lawyer called character witnesses, all of whom said they couldn't believe that Cameron would commit murder, with the lawyer going as far as to suggest that Cameron should actually be praised for making friends with kids from such a diverse background. Terrell's defense would downplay his gang affiliations, saying that he was simply fascinated by gang culture from listening to music and watching movies. Even sidestepping arguments from the prosecution regarding his W chest tattoo being a sign of gang membership, suggesting instead that the tattoo was simply paying homage to basketball player Kevin Durant, who apparently had the same tattoo. Ultimately, the explosive trial would take place, with Terrell's lawyer fiercely defending him on these points, as depicted in courtroom sketches. And ultimately, after a trial and a 10-day jury deliberation, all of which Terrell was allowed to go home every single night and sleep in his own bed, eventually a verdict was reached on Monday the 23rd of July 2018, and Cameron Terrell was ultimately acquitted of all charges, as reported on by CBS News. The jury found Cameron Terrell not guilty of all counts in last year's deadly shooting in South Los Angeles. It is a blow to the prosecution who said, despite his affluent background, Terrell ran around with known gang members. Jurors also found Terrell not guilty of two counts of attempted murder of two other men who were not injured in the shooting that killed 21-year-old Justin Holmes. Cameron Terrell would make a surprise statement after his acquittal where he said rest in peace to the victim, a bizarre moment which had a few people giving him the side eye. I'll say rest in peace Justin Holmes. He should have died that day and 
you know, I pray for his family every night. This this been weighing on me every single day of my life. I don't have to explain myself to anyone. God knows what really happened that day, and God knows what was in my head that day. I'm just happy to be free. I'm happy this is over with. Terrell's lawyer said outright that he believed his defense of Cameron was a good story because of his background, his family, where he resides, and his school. Going on to say that he believed the case was a result of blatant overcharging by the prosecutors and suggesting that Cameron was at best a witness to a murder and that's it. With Cameron's lawyer even telling the court that Cameron now had a newfound love for the law and as a result he would be headed to Houston to pursue a law degree. And so as Cameron Terrell rode off into the sunset and back to the Palos Verdes estates, once again on the receiving end of the many privileges he'd been born into, his co-defendants and the victim's family would be left reeling at the injustice and unfairness of this outcome. many people were not satisfied with the verdict of Cameron's trial, especially those living in the neighborhood where the murder took place. Two black juveniles are probably facing a life sentence to where an adult took them to do something where he should have been held responsible just as much. The father of one of the juveniles accused of the murder would tell journalists that his son was going through hell in the juvenile system, even turning 17 behind bars, and suggesting plainly that it was all due to race that Terrell was able to walk three whilst his son remains in jail. Now, due to their status as juveniles, it was never publicly revealed what the outcome of Cameron's black co-defendants were. However, it's hard to believe that they would have benefited from the same leniency, let alone having the funds for a top private defense lawyer to craft such a rock-solid defense. Following the verdict, numerous articles would appear suggesting that race and white privilege was responsible for Cameron avoiding the consequences, with others labelling him as an LA gang culture vulture. However, others would argue that there's a more level-headed explanation of Cameron's not guilty verdict, with some suggesting that the outcome might simply be the result of a bad effort by the prosecution, who spent far too much time focusing on proving Terrell's affiliation with the gang, rather than his direct association with the actual murder, with others suggesting that it's commonplace for prosecutors to fail to convict people for murder who didn't actually fire the fatal shot, with some citing a previous case of a car-to-car -car shooting where a black 22-year-old who was driving the car was also acquitted on similar grounds. So now for the question on everybody's mind. What did Cameron Terrell do next, after beating this body and regaining his freedom? Well, I know some of you will be disappointed to learn that he didn't start a lucrative career as a drill rapper. In fact, he has kept an incredibly low profile since this case came to a close. The majority of his social media profiles have been taken down or set to private, and many of the earlier images and clips of him with his family and friends have been scrubbed from the internet. However, there's still a rumor circulating that he still bangs for the Crips under the name Blue Eyes, with Reddit posts on the Cali banging subreddit circulating an allegedly recent image of him. Chico, the rolling 90s crip who was in that neighborhood anthem video with Cameron back in the day, was asked about him again in a more recent Innovators interview, but once again refused to comment. He used to be uh, somebody named Cameron Terrell. Hell no. It was actually reported in March 2019 that Terrell had been arrested once again, apparently being accused of a carjacking during a wild spring break session back when he was deep into it with the rolling 90s. A wealthy young man acquitted last year in a gang murder is again in legal trouble. Cameron Terrell from Palos Verdes Estates is in jail once again. Jeff, his attorney just told reporters tonight that Cameron Terrell was arrested at Rancho Palos Verdes Estates last night on suspicion of attempted carjacking from a case more than a year ago. Uh, this all happened, he says, during Terrell's spring break. The two South Los Angeles juveniles he was with are still in custody, facing charges for attempted murder. And just as friends say Terrell was moving on with his life, in college preparing to study law. Tonight, a spokesperson for the LAPD told me during the lengthy murder investigation, detectives with the LAPD and the district attorney's office uncovered new felony crimes they believe Terrell committed while he was a juvenile. They can't say what the crimes were, only that Terrell was arrested last night. And he would appear to retain his same lawyer, Javon Blacknell, for this new accusation, with Blacknell suggesting that the cops were simply looking to pin something on Terrell because they failed to pin the murder of Justin Holmes on him. However, LAPD detectives suggested that they had suspected Terrell of numerous crimes whilst investigating his original murder, but declining to comment in more detail, and ultimately nothing publicly ever came of that case, and as far as the public know, no further charges have been brought against Cameron Terrell. Perhaps Javon Blacknell pulled off another sweet courtroom maneuver for his wealthy client, getting him out of any additional charges completely. Or perhaps Cameron Terrell truly learnt his lesson, gained a newfound love for the law, and has indeed managed to keep himself out of trouble for all of these years since. 
This incident is ultimately the last the world heard publicly from Cameron Terrell, and ever since this case, he's managed to keep a very low profile with a completely non-existent internet presence. However, as the years went on, more and more people have commented on this case. An amazing mini-documentary was made on the topic by the YouTube channel Hood Politics, and that video racked up around 9 million views, reigniting interest in the injustice behind the situation. The case has also been brought up in numerous interviews like on Vlad TV, where DJ Vlad himself would actually mock Terrell, inferring that he must have snitched to get out of this situation. So he probably testified against all of them. Possibly. I don't think there's any possibly about it. <laughs> probably it had to have been a deal where he told them everything. Now, that's an interesting point, because I saw a lot of comments in the course of researching this video that really surprised me. Because whilst the majority of people categorized Cameron Terrell as a privileged white kid who was obsessed with gangs and fled back to the suburbs as soon as the going got tough, others on the internet still appear to have a lot of respect for Cameron. A lot of people assume that Cameron Terrell wouldn't be good in the hood or accepted by his former gang affiliates due to what happened in this case. However, the consensus from many commenters online is that he would still be respected in the hood because he stood solid and didn't snitch on his co-defendants. In fact, some images have circulated suggesting that many rolling 90s gang members still believe that Cameron Terrell kept it more solid than many real gangbangers who would snitch. Some rumors have even circulated suggesting that Cameron's two co-defendants have directly confirmed that Cameron didn't snitch and that his name does not appear anywhere on their paperwork, with some even going as far to point out that Cameron Terrell had abided by the street code more stringently than Takashi69. At this point, I just want to make it very clear that this story is nothing to glorify or glamorize. As much as I'd like to say that this is a cautionary tale of the consequences of falling into the gang lifestyle, at the end of the day, Cameron Terrell didn't really face any consequences. He didn't even have to wait in jail during his trial. He was able to use every resource he had available to him to improve his chances of getting the result he wanted, all while his less fortunate, black co-defendants were subjected to much harsher treatment. But at the end of the day, the most important thing here is justice, because regardless of how different people were treated in in this case, the one person who was treated the worst in this situation was the innocent young black man who lost his life at the hands of lost and misguided gangbangers. The senseless killing of a young black man with his whole life ahead of him is truly the most tragic consequence of the gangbanging lifestyle, and it doesn't necessarily matter what colour the person is on the other end of the pistol to acknowledge that what's going on is not okay and that we need to do something to try and improve this situation. I hope you had the opportunity to learn something from this video. I definitely learned from writing it. Thank you for watching and rest in peace to Justin Holmes.